to preface this, um, we're going to begin this from a Marxist-Leninist perspective. So to be clear, there are a lot of people who always reproach me and they always come to me and they ask, Kaz, are you a Marxist-Leninist or are you a Duganist? Are you a Nazbul? Now, the Communist Party of the United States is being infiltrated by someone named Terran, right? Terran, to be perfectly clear, right, is in all likelihood someone who has shady um, connections and backgrounds at best. Realistically, I do think... They are probably involved with the government in some capacity or some kind of NGO. Definitely not loyal communists. They were responsible for destroying the Workers' World Party. And if you didn't know, earlier this year, they were actually responsible for a uh, um, this, like hit piece talking about the infiltration of Duganism on the left, right? And now I did release an article responding to it and rebuking it. But something I've never done, and I think the, the recent Russian special military operation, especially... Um, calls uh, into necessity is actually give Dugan some justice in his own right and kind of explain to you who Dugan is, what his background is, and what not only what Marxist-Leninists can learn from Dugan and what conclusions we can draw from Dugan's thinking, but how Dugan's thinking can help us understand the recent Russian special military operation. So this is what I wanted to get into. Now, firstly, the first thing that's going to come to mind when it comes to Dugan, and we're actually going to watch a 60 Minutes interview um, of Dugan after I give this kind of introductory lecture. We're going to watch it together and react to it. So the first thing that comes to mind when people think about Dugan, Alexander Dugan, is geopolitics. Geopolitics and the geopolitical orientation and the geopolitical school, right? Because Dugan wrote a book, I believe in the 1990s, called The Foundations of Geopolitics, okay? Okay. And in his book, The Foundations of Geopolitics, Dugan basically wrote about, you know, in addition to this kind of philosophy of geopolitics and all that background, like a rough understanding of like Russia's place in the world going forward after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Like what, who should Russia be allied with? Who are Russia's enemies going to be? What, you know, territory should Russia annex? Things like that. That's in the foundations of geopolitics. So people have this broad idea that, Give me a second. Let me just finish this protein drink and I'll finish what I was saying. Perfect. So people basically have this idea that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia became a liberal democracy. And then Putin came to take over. And then what's Putin's long-term strategy? Like Putin kind of seems like he's got these revanchist ambitions, you know, with Georgia and elsewhere, right? So people are saying, well, Putin has a brain behind him. It's Putin's brain, the secret guy who's deciding Russia's long-term strategy going forward, which is Alexander Dugin. Dugin is the ideological brain. He's the geo geopolitical strategic brain for Russia. All of this is mythology and all of it is bullshit. Now, to, my, to the extent of my knowledge, the um, foundations of geopolitics did make its way into the um, Russian military curriculum, right? I mean, geopolitics is an important science in general, and that book covers it. And it actually has not been translated into English uh, as of this day. <laughs> but um, of special note is going to be the fact that there is this prejudice of idealism generally. Now, we are Marxist-Leninist materialists, right? We have a materialist orientation. What idealists tend to do is assume that there has to be this certain body of thought and ideas that rationalizes and makes the world somehow meaningful or at least unified and coherent. So when people see that Russia is doing this, this, or that, they're saying, okay, what is the reason for this? Well, the reason for this ultimately must come from an idea, right? And that's where you have people kind of attribute so much to Dugin when it comes to explaining Russia, that he is the direct idea behind it. Um, but the materialist view is going to be that, you know, the ideologists and individuals will have ideas that reflect and give expression to the deeper rationality of history and the spirit of the times, but that's not actually where it's coming from. There's a deeper material explanation for this, which the idea only reflects. So in the case of Russia and Russian geopolitics, right, the Marxist-Leninist view is not going to be that, you know, Dugin's ideas are somehow mysteriously animating history. It's that Dugin's ideas are reflecting history in some kind of way, right? And that's really the important um, thing you have to come from. That's the, in a very important perspective we have to come from right off the bat, right? So something important to keep in mind um, as an introduction to Dugin is that I want to talk about first, I want to talk about geopolitics. Why should Marxist-Leninists take geopolitics seriously? 
what is the significance of geopolitics? What is the background? And what are we talking about when we come when it comes to that, right? So geopolitics is in the is in the word. It's the relationship between states, polities, if you will, and geography or space, right? So if you understand it like this, um, if you have a kind of German idealist understanding of the state, a state isn't just some external body of governance that interacts with us. The state is the externalization of the human mind and of reason, right? The state is the realization of the wealth geist of spirit on earth. That's what the state is, if you have this understanding of statehood. The state is a kind of organ of our minds. We are part of the state, right? And then in that sense, beginning with this understanding of the state is this fundamental organism that grounds our unconscious, that grounds human communities and worlds even, a human world, right? If you have this understanding, this more German understanding of a state from German idealism, it's kind of Hegelian understanding of, of a state, then you can easily see that um, I mean, that's kind of a more mythological, mythic or mystical way of putting it. If you want to go to an American pragmatic way of putting it, you have to say, okay, um, what, how is a state defined, right? And it, you, it doesn't matter how you look at this, right? A state also, in, a state involves something called history. Sorry. It involves something called territory. A state is delimited. This amount of territory is the belonging of the state. It belongs to the state, right? So you have this understanding that with a state comes a definite projection of space, okay? And then also, states also have history, not only in the forms of like the founding mythology and all that kind of stuff, but also in the form of the laws of the state. Uh, also in the forms of just how you keep track of time itself, right? Um, the ab ability to regulate and ground the daily cycles of life and formalize those things. So a state also has a projection of time. So time and space, in a sense, are relative to states. A state um, presides over abstract space and abstract time, okay? In a sense. Um, you know, this... In a Hobbesian view of a state, the state is this kind of supreme formal entity that projects formal sovereignty and abstract space irregardless of the territory. So if you kind of think about Hobbes's Leviathan, right? A Leviathan is a sea creature, right? And just as much, Hobbes's notion of a state is based on the geography of this kind of imminently abstract fluid space over which any form of sovereignty can be arbitrarily exercised over. So for Hobbes, who has this kind of modern, like Cartesian understanding of a state, the formal sovereign state comes first, the space comes after. In no way is the state defined by the particularity of the geography or the particularity over, of the land over which it presides. It can mold space as if it was the sea, and it's all just water on the sea, right? Um, that's the Leviathan. It's a sea monster, right? Um, so we are not yet at the point of geopolitics. Why? Because in this case, geography is just some kind of like, you know, inessential detail, this incidental detail of state sovereignty. Geography isn't important. The sovereign is important, right? How could geography have any significance, right? The state is absolute. It has an absolute monopoly of space and time, and it, it, it commands the submission of, of all particularity before it, right? That's the true meaning of, um, of sovereignty. And that is actually reflective of the British Empire itself, which is a maritime empire. The British Empire you know, it's a, it's a naval empire on the sea, and it stretches the whole fucking world, right? It doesn't care about your particular culture, doesn't care about the particular geography, doesn't care about whatever, you know? It is this Leviathan, right? That's the British Empire, right? And um, it's this kind of abstract universalism of modernity, over which the whole world must be molded. The world must be molded in its image, okay? Now, whether you want to look at this in terms of the rationalistic hubris 
of modernity, right? Where, you know, you just don't have any sense of that particularity that marks a point of exception within the continuity of your experience of space and time and law and sovereignty and whatever else you want to talk about, right? Um, or in the naivety of empiricism, according to which there's just kind of like this given world of sense objects within which we just kind of like, you know, this is where hedonism comes. We just kind of enjoy. We just have this continuous experience of constantly gratifying ourselves or, you know, dwelling in this world, um, touching things, I guess, or whatever, right? It's kind of like English view, English empiricism, where we're just kind of like, you know, our hands are kind of just everywhere, and we're just kind of grubbing and touching and accumulating wealth, greed, right? This kind of fat capitalist of the English uh, Industrial Revolution, whatever, right? It's pretty much the same thing. Now, where exactly within this does geopolitics emerge, right? Well, geopolitics is going to emerge. Okay, you guys are complaining about the yellow tint. Fine. Fine. And I need a new fucking kit. And I, it's because I have a yellow fucking light. Okay? There we go. No more yellow. All right. So, much better. So, within German idealism, or the German tradition, you have probably the first challenge to the kind of tyranny of Anglo-Saxon modernity in history, right? Now, this takes many forms. The first form that probably comes to mind is German idealism. Kant, in his critique of pure reason, says what? There's no pure reason... And there's also no pure experience. There's a problem. There's a little contradiction. There's a little issue, a little scandal posed by particularity. Kant begins that German idealism there. From there, we get Hegel and the rest of them, right? Then also, the Germans also give us people like Marx, right? And then what does Marx do? Marx critiques idealism itself. Marx um, forwards the view that uh, within this kind of universal state, you have the particularity of the proletariat and this kind of class struggle and this materialist view of history, right? And then, you know, beyond Marx, what do you have? You have Schopenhauer, right? And Schopenhauer's critique of the kind of lofty endeavors of the German idealism. Schopenhauer with this kind of like more pessimistic view about the real thing that drives us behind, beyond, uh, below the surface of the sovereign uh, and stoic use of reason, right? The the will of the universe or whatever, right? And then you also have Nietzsche, and Nietzsche it becomes even dialed up to uh, dialed up to more of a hundred, right? Even though Nietzsche he was kind of pretty friendly with the British, but that, I, let's just skip that one, right? And then you have Freud, and Freud challenges. So Germans have this thing where they're kind of throwing a a, a wrench. What do they call it? They throw a wrench in the um. What is the saying? Someone quickly in the chat tell me what the saying is. They're throwing a, uh, I'm going to just look it up on Google because the delay is literally like five minutes. Okay, I guess, I don't know. If, yeah, they threw a, they, they have this thing where they're, they're throwing a monkey wrench into the works, into the gears. Yeah, that's what it is. They're throwing a wrench into the gears of Anglo-Saxon modernity. And they're, they're imposing this problem, this problem, the fact that our premises cannot be grounded according to our conclusion. The whole basis of German romanticism comes from here. The whole basis of nationalism comes from here, by the way. Nationalism is more or less German in origin. The French nationalism of the, the revolution, that was just this, that you know unmediated French passion, that kind of Catholic passion. It was the Germans who sat down and contemplated this question of, okay, on the one hand, we have the rational state, but what are the roots? What are the real wild roots of that? Because the state doesn't determine what that is, right? So everything, it begins with the German challenge to Anglo-Saxon uh, modernity, right? Now, continuing, funny rant about German philosophers with no Kusa, Leibniz, or Schiller. Because those people are not defined by bringing up problems. That's why. You're, it's getting too complicated at that point. Those people are not defined by a problem, by a stain, by a mark, right? So I don't think that they have the same significance here. Um, but anyway, geopolitics simply comes from this humble understanding, right? Um, even though geopolitics, I think, is actually British, formally speaking, it's British in origin, but it comes from a German problem. It comes from the competition between the United Kingdom, sorry, I don't know if it's called the United Kingdom, the British Empire, right? 
on the one hand, which is a sea-based power, and on the other hand, these land-based empires to the east, particularly the German Empire, specifically, you know, the one united by um, uh, Bismarck, right? The German land empire, right? And then also the Russian Empire, right? Which the, which, um, the British Empire was fighting with both of them, fighting with the Russians and uh, fighting that great game in uh, Southwest Asia, in Afghanistan, and with the Germans over hegemony over continental Europe, okay? And the problem posed by both of these land civilizations is that they represented something which was the opposite of the kind of sea-based British civilization, which was the fact that for them, sovereignty was not derivative from itself, simply sovereignty. Sovereignty derived from the particular. So the particular land, the earthliness of the character of the people, the character of the geography, the character of the roots, the soil below, that is what has the determinating effect, not this kind of leviathan in the sea. It's this more grounded, earth-based empires, or if you want to call them behemoth, the land monster, not the sea monster. The sea monster only can, doesn't have a notion of land. It just has the sea over which it seeks to exercise its dominion and domination. It doesn't have an understanding of the land which grounds our ability to dominate things in the first place. So Britain can, for example, not arbitrate the terms, uh, the particular characters and features of continental Europe, or uh, let's say Afghanistan. So this comes ultimately to give birth to people like, uh, I forgot his name. Uh, Who wrote the world island? Again, what the fuck was his name? Heartland? The book wasn't called The World Island. It was um, the geopolit... Okay, this is the one. Yeah, Mackinder, Mackinder. That's exactly it. Mackinder, Mackinder, Mackinder. Yes, Mackinder. Okay, and Mackinder was British, okay? He was British, but he was responding to a German problem. And even, in so- even as far as the conflict with uh, Russia was concerned, well, Russia was dominated by a Germanic aristocracy, and the, the family, royal family of Russia was... Germanized, right? Was Mackinder an American? I didn't know that. Let me see. Let me look him up. Mackinder. No, he was English. He was British. He was not an American. He was British. That one I remember. He was not an American. He was a British, okay? He was British. Okay, so to be clear, geopolitics comes from the fact that somehow scandalously, despite the kind of domineering conquest of modernity and Anglo-Saxon modernity in particular, Land appears to have a determinant effect. Geography has a determinating effect. It's not simply... A a lot of people misunderstand this. Oh, Dugan and Russia want world domination. That is not the point of geopolitics. The point of geopolitics is how geography defines power in the first place. How geography not only defines our ability to exercise power, because you can kind of... You know, you can pervert that in a utilitarian sense. Be like, okay, how do we get more land in order to exercise more power? No. The scope and ambition of our power is also defined by geography. So you see, the geopolitical perspective is not beginning from one of wanting to conquer the whole world and wanting to impose your power on the world. It's beginning from one that takes into account existing historical empires based in the land that have already been there, have already been defined by it, and whose destiny and whose future is beholden to it. So that is the essence of geopolitics. So when you get this impression from Dugan, from Alexander Dugan, that the geopolitical perspective brought by him is one of Russian aggression, you need to understand you are... You are bogged down by this kind of Leviathan from Hobbes, this Anglo-Saxon prejudice, according to which we are all detached, modern Anglo-Saxon subjects who simply want to exercise our domineering modern will upon the world and conquer as much land as we want, right? No, that is not the case. So do not associate Dugan with aggression. Do not associate the geopolitical uh, perspective with this one of, oh, we just want to aggressively conquer the world. No. 
It's actually the opposite. The geopolitical perspective is based on precedent civilization, land-based civilization that is already there. In the English view, we are not already here. We have to conquer the world, then we can be here. From the geopolitical perspective, we are already here. So it is not a question of how do we conquer the world. It is a question of how do we exist here? How do we be here as we already are? What is our fate? What are we doing going forward? What is our destiny? That is the geopolitical perspective that is ultimately going to be informing Dugan's position. Now, being more specific about Dugan, to give you some historical background, Dugan was a kind of anti-communist dissident. Now, that's going to sound kind of scary because, oh, how could you be a Marxist-Leninist and promote... Well, because an anti-communist dissident was just someone who was opposed to the ruling Communist Party in the Soviet Union. But in case you didn't know this, Gorbachev was the head of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union at a certain point. I mean, these people, and I'm going to reiterate this again. I'm going to talk about this again. These people are the ones who, who destroyed the Soviet Union. And they all became liberals, by the way. All of these communists became liberals. Keep that in mind, okay? They all became liberals. The ones that were in power. Almost all of them, okay? So that's something you got to keep in mind. Um, he was a kind of dissident. And by being a dissident, he saw that... The Marxist-Leninist ideology that had existed in its late Soviet form was not addressing questions fundamental to the future of Russian civilization. There's a Russian civilization whose spiritual, geopolitical, even pragmatic needs and future was not being addressed by Marxist-Leninist ideology, by, by Marxism-Leninism, right? And then with the end of the Soviet Union and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the question is pretty simple. What's the future of Russia? What is the future of Russia as a country? Is Russia going to abide by the international norms of, you know, uh, like state sovereignty, where every state has the right to self-determination based on internationally recognized treaties, and that's it, and we're all going to become nation-state democracies, or is there something stirring within the Russian soul? Is there this kind of atavistic longing within the Russian, the core of the Russian being that demands to be broken, to break out of the liberal international order? And for Dugin, there is something inside of the very essence of what it means to be Russian that could, will always resist domestication in the liberal international order. Russia, not Germany, is going to pose a problem for the Leviathan this time around. <clears throat> so I got ahead of myself a little bit. So let's bring it back. Let's bring it back a little. Now, was Dugan just... Now, okay, that is ultimately going to hinge on the following question. Russia is a particularly interesting case, which is uncharted territory for Marxist Lendis. It wasn't supposed to happen. Now, the, the, the story goes like this. Russia had a bourgeois revolution. Then it had a proletarian revolution. And then what? It returned back to bourgeois liberalism, and then that's it? There was no fundamentally irreversible significance. The Soviet Union and, and, and the proletarian dictatorship and socialism and Marxism-Leninism had on the Russian civilization. So the liberals contended themselves with. It was all one meaningless mistake. It was all one meaningless bad mistake. And who knows? That's not from us. Or that's for the Chinese. Those Chinese, they have, you know... <laughs> That's kind of the Russian liberal perspective in the 1990s, you know? Oh, that's how oh, we were victims. Of something more east from Asia came and <laughs> imposed that on us. Now we're free. Um, so you see, uh, now, shamefully, believe it or not, most Marxists believe the liberals. Most Marxists will say, yeah, Lenin was kind of stretching it. Stalin was kind of stretching it. And then Mao stretched it way too far. Let's go back to the roots of European civilization, and then we can conduct the class struggle again. Back to liberal democracy. Lenin, after all, I mean, Marxism came from the West. So it's no surprise, and this is what I'm going to tell you, all of the communists, almost all of the communists in Russia, all of these Marxists, they almost all became liberals. So if you believe that Lenin 
If you believe that Lenin specifically had made an irreversible contribution, it wasn't a one-off, it wasn't just some exception, the Leninism part in Marxism-Leninism isn't just an exception, but a qualitative transformation that is irreversible. If you believe in Lenin's last thesis as a Marxist-Leninist that what if we can pursue, pursue the fundamental requisites to civilization in a non-European fashion, almost ad verbatim what Lenin said, right? You do have to take Dugan seriously. You do have to take these questions seriously. Has Russia simply reverted to the pre-communist and pre-socialist bourgeois liberal status? Or are there fundamental and particular features of Russian civilization that disallow it to be as such? If you acknowledge that particularity, you have already positioned yourself outside of Western Marxist orthodoxy. Again, almost all the communists in Russia, almost all of them turned into liberals, turned into westernizing liberals. They say, okay, we went too far. We gave too many compromises to the Russian aspect. Let's go back to liberalism from square one. So don't blame Dugin for not being a Marxist-Leninist. When Marxism-Leninism, as it had existed then, was not able to answer the big questions, okay? Now, let's rewind it a little bit before we go forward and we connect this to Russia's special military operation. Let's rewind this a little bit and talk about... Um, we're going to talk about, actually, Lenin because it's going to give you insight into where Dugin is coming from. Now, what was Lenin's real significance? And this is really going to give you what the essence of Eurasianism really is. Lenin's significance was that he was a consistent Marxist. For Lenin, Marxism was something that was happening in the West. The social democratic parties in the West, they had a whole workers' move behind, and Lenin took that whole thing as a whole. He took the West and Marxism, he took it as a whole, as a whole. Why could he take it as a whole? Because he was outside of it. In order to see something holistically, you have to be outside of it. In order to see the forest and not the trees, you have to be outside of the forest. Now, does this logic make sense to you guys? Does this logic make sense to you guys uh, in any way? In order to see the forest, you have to be outside of it. Otherwise, if you're in the forest, you're just going to see the trees. Now, skipping a lot, more or less, that is why Lenin was a consistent revolutionary and that's why the Western Social Democrats sold out. Because Lenin was able to see it holistically, uniquely coming from that Russian perspective. Now, Dugin will remark that actually this defines the entirety of the history of Russian philosophy and the history of the Russian, the uniquely Russian intellectual tradition. Because for Dugin, right, all Russian philosophers had either set about to take Western philosophy as a whole or kind of copy the Western philosophers and try to dwell within it. And all of Russia's history since Peter the Great's reforms had been defined by this kind of back and forth between, on the one hand, this archaic Russian soul, which we can't rationally give expression to, but which nonetheless dwells within the Russian soul, right? And on the other hand, the kind of logos of Western modernity, of rational modernity. So for Dugin, the entire history of Russian philosophy and Russian thought had been based in trying to kind of rationalize and give expression to this more archaic Russian feeling and Russian soul, this Russian unconscious, if you will, the unconscious features of Russian civilization. Um, and it had always failed. It had always failed. It had always failed to establish what Dugin will call a uniquely Russian hermeneutic circle. So it's this kind of back and so the, the liberal reforms in the 90s for Dugin was just a moment in this history, right? Where on the one hand, you have this archaic Russian soul that allows you to be outside of Europe. But on the other hand, you don't have your own independent logos, your own independent vocabulary, your own independent language and rationality, that allows you to give justice to this archaic Russian soul outside of the terms of Western Europe. So this is the paradox that basically defines the Russian civilization. This is why the eagle is double-headed. 
From the West, it takes the superstructure of Western modernity and Western rationality. But on the other hand, there's just this point of exception in the form of this unconscious whatever reality that not just resists this, but is it. And that's really what we're talking about here. It's non-all, as Lacan would put it. It's not just that there's some aspect of Russia that's outside of Western modernity. It is that. It is that. Just like a forest is not its trees. It is the whole. But the whole looks different than what we expect it to sometimes. See? But that's not Dugin's perspective. For Dugin, the path forward for Russia is to discover another beginning beyond the beginning of the West and Western modernity that adequately satisfies this kind of inner Russian essence. Now, I, we're Marxist now, so you're saying, Haas, what does this have to do with Marxism? What does this have to do with materialism? You're talking about a Russian soul and a Russian essence and a Russian unconscious. This is all idealist and this is all metaphysical language. Well, it's metaphysical sounding language only in order to give expression to what is otherwise very simply materiality. It is the materiality of Russian civilization as opposed to the ideal of Western modernity. It's what is material. That is actually what materialism has as its object. The unconscious, the earthly, the terrestrial, that's material. That's what material means. That's what material means, okay? So, that begs the question from us, right? Lenin's contribution to Marxism, which was interpreted as just like this kind of added, this is, he just added something a little. It's just a little exception he had to add for Russia's unique conditions, right? Is that going to culminate in a qualitative transformation um, that changes where we started from from the very beginning, which was liberalism, Western liberalism? Or do we return to the Western liberalism? And for Dugan, he's, it's not that he's a fascist, it's that he refuses this view that we can simply return to Western liberalism. For him, the task set before Russia is to discover its own logos. Marxism-Leninism was not some like, you know, that's a, it's a comedy. The way Western Marxist-Leninists understand it, it's, com it's comical. They said, oh yeah, Marx said this, but you know, Russia, yeah, it was different. So Lenin kind of added to it a little bit, but that's okay. We don't have to add it to it anymore. We're done. And then you can go full schizo mode and you could be like, you know, Baba Vakin. Like, no, we have Marxism, Leninism, Chairman Gonzaloism, Baba Vakinism. You never, never ending heads added to the number of heads. And it's like, at what point are we going to have a qualitatively new understanding of what Marxism was the whole time? Instead of adding more heads, we should probably question the first head our understanding of the first head. You understand? And that in this case, um, I'm kind of way getting ahead of myself, even beyond Dugan, because now I'm talking about what distinguishes my thought, right? Which was for me that we need to change our view of Marxism in the first place because of this, instead of adding more heads. But nonetheless, Dugan is up the same alley because Dugan is also searching for that original logos. Dugan is not a Marxist-Leninist, not because he's a fascist reactionary, but because he realizes that Marxism-Leninism was already a stretch. So why was it a stretch? Or more specifically, what was stretching it? What about Russia made that necessary? And that is what Dugin is concerning himself with. Now for Dugin, if we are not going to return to this kind of um, nation-state liberal international order after the Soviet Union, that there was this irreversible change that had happened, that doesn't just have implications for Russia. It has implications for the entire international world order itself. Russia, ex let me put it this way. Let's say it's like someone who went to war. You know, they go to, they go to war and they've seen things. Human beings are not supposed to see. And they come back to society and they can't be well-functioning members of society because they've seen truths they can see others are blind to and naive about and hypocritical about. It's like you have lived in peace this whole time unaware of this truth. And this is why Russia is such a troublemaker for the international world order. Russia has experienced the history. It has experienced something, just like a soldier going off to war and being changed forever. Russia has experiencing something that, had give, that gave it insight into the nature of not only politics and geo, but being itself. So, and this, what this is, is the fact that 
There is a Russian civilization. There is a Russian polarity. There is a Russian big space, which does not conform to the terms imposed by the liberal nation state. The liberal nation state will mutilate this civilization, which is a real thing. It's real. It's a real thing. But on the other hand, Russia cannot simply pursue its destiny, its specific destiny, without upsetting the entirety of the whole liberal international world, world order. So you have this kind of paradox. Russia just wants to be Russia, but it can't be Russia without destroying the world as we know it. And Dugan has become the intellectual, like par excellence, who represents this fact. So, and, and now as far as Russia's special military operation in Ukraine is concerned, and why this helps us understand it is, look, we can focus on the facts of the operation and how the West has been lying about and all that shit, but I think it, it, it might even be better to just have a more broad perspective about what's going on in the first place that allow you to see. Ukraine is part of Russia's big space. It is part of Russian civilization. That doesn't mean Russia thinks it can Wait. invade... Thoughts on Elon trying to take over Twitter? Many thoughts. Many thoughts. And I think we'll, if we have time, we're going to discuss that today. We're going to discuss that today, right? But um, when it comes to this special military operation in Ukraine, what mo this is what's so dangerous about this. When most people see Russia invaded Ukraine, upsetting and overturning all of the precedent, liberal international norms of, of the world order, of a sovereign country invading another sovereign country. They're like, okay, well, if Russia did that to Ukraine, then Russia can do that to any country with impunity because it's all arbitrary and meaningless. But what you can learn from someone like Dugan is that, no, you're just not understanding the deeper pattern and the deeper laws at hand. It is not arbitrary invasion of another per uh, country's sovereignty because it is part of Russian civilization. And just because Russian civilization cannot be given expression in the terms of the liberal nation state does not mean it's arbitrary or meaningless. It doesn't mean Russia thinks it has the right to invade France. Ukraine is part of Russia's big space. The two peoples are inexorably intertwined. But that even kind of assumes Russia is just invading Ukraine. And that's not what's going on at all. Russia still respects, respected Ukraine's sovereignty. It's just that Ukraine's sovereignty cannot come at the expense of Russia's civilization. You can't, it's not a blank check for Ukraine to do whatever the fuck it wants. And this is where the cold, sobering realities of geopolitics enter into the picture. Just because a country has sovereignty doesn't mean it can act however the fuck it wants to with impunity. When you have two peoples who are so closely intertwined, especially the Eastern Ukrainian peoples and the Russian peoples, and the Eastern Ukrainian people, those are Russian peoples, when their culture, when their fate, when their connection, when their way of life is so inexorably intertwined, you don't just have a blank check form of sovereignty that allows you to do whatever the fuck you want. So when you hear this story that Russia's randomly invading Ukraine, you have to understand Ukraine has always been part of Russia's civilization. The word Ukraine, and Logo was trying to tell this to that ugly fuck destiny, that fucking goblin, it means the frontier. That's what it means. Ukraine translates into frontier in Russian. It's what it means. So that's what you have to understand. It's not an arbitrary act of aggression. There's a history and there's a story behind this. But the thing is, is that we have to change our understanding of how the world works because of it. We can't just proceed with our specific view of how the world works. Russia has, must challenge and change our view of international relations. And we must shift to a multipolar view of international relations that takes civilizations and polarities into account. Now, maybe the British will have a hard time doing this, and they can go to hell if they do, because it's not our problem as Americans. We, as Americans, are faced in a unique, we are faced with the unique opportunity to embrace America as a land-based civilization, from sea to shining sea, the land here in between those seas. To cultivate that, that's what we're faced with the unique opportunity of doing. And we should take this opportunity. We should take this opportunity to befriend the Russian world and build our own American world. 
alongside the Russian world and leave the British Empire's Leviathan to burn in hell. That's the unique opportunity we are presently fa uh, faced. We as Western subjects, when we hear the word Russia, just like Russia has a unique connection to the West, the West has a unique connection to Russia. For us, Russia is always here, but not here. Russia's very existence to us evokes a degree of criminality. Me being called a Russian in the Financial Times report is somehow criminal. Me saying things that the Kremlin is saying was incriminating enough for Twitch to completely deplatform me. Because it, it's something scary, nefarious, and criminal to be Russian. Russianness is bad and criminal. It's malign. It's outside of our border. It's outside of our wall. What we in the West must accept and embrace is that Russia is what we are. Russia is the West. It's the truth of the West. Russia is the truth, the scandalous truth, which is that Europe does not exist. Europe is a peninsula of Asia. And Russia is the universality of Europe. It is the universality, the concrete universality of the so-called Western civilization. Because what is Western civilization? Western civilization is Christian civilization. And Russia is primordial, orthodox Christianity, which is the truth of all Christianity before it becomes anything else. It's the original Europe. It's the original Christianity which at the same time makes it Asian. Russia is Europe as just one among many other Asiatic empires. And we in the West deny this. We in the West are troubled by this and we're somehow intimidated by this because we don't, we're scared to embrace and accept what we are, what our civilization really is in the West. We run from our own shadow. We run from what we are. We, d we curse and forsake a spitting image of what we are. <clears throat> I think that's a good introduction. I think that's a good introduction. And there's way more. And the only way you're going to get more is if I do more lectures that go into more detail. Or if you read Dugan himself. And I, if for books, I recommend Political Platonism, which is really going to be the crux of this. It's about finding a new beginning. Because what Dugan deals with is what is Russia? What is the West for Russia? What we must ask is what is Russia for the West? What is Russia for the West is our question. We must ask that question. How will Russia change our world? We in the West must change our view of Russia. We see Russia as criminal, enemy, bad, nefarious, Asian. Because we run from ourselves. And this view is fundamentally genocidal. This view is fundamentally genocidal. Again, you read that article they wrote about me that got me deplatformed on Twitch, lost my whole livelihood, lost my whole way of uh, paying bills and, and uh, supporting myself. Why? Because I look too Russian. I sound too Russian. I'm too, there's too much Russianness coming from my street. And that's alone enough to incriminate me. That alone is enough to incriminate because Russia's the bad guy. Russia's the orcs, as they say. And they've adopted this anti-human, barbaric view. How do they justify? That's the question. How do they fucking justify? The West is entering an unprecedented state of psychosis. That much I can say. That much I can definitely say.